Uh, junior church is dismissed. I'll slide these out of the way because if you ever see me up here, I like to pace. <laughs> Apparently, I was told I pace too much, so I'll limit my steps today. Let's see here. So, as you can see from the projector there, we're covering, we're starting 2 Peter. And, uh, doing chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. But before we get started, I'll open us in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so just so thankful and grateful to be in your house today, to worship you, Lord, to glorify you in all your majesty and excellence. We're just so thankful to have others join and become members of this church body, a family. Just ask that I deliver this message today, Lord. These words be yours, not mine. Use me as your vessel. And as we just celebrated Veterans Day this week, Lord, we honor those that sacrifice their lives so we can enjoy our freedoms. And just give comfort to the families who have lost loved ones that we honor them and will never forget the sacrifice that they have made. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, so Second Peter. Uh, as we rolled out of First Peter, it was, uh, he talked about uh, strength for Christians that are needed that are being persecuted. So he was kind of foretelling what uh, he's going through now, which is what is happening now. So 2 Peter was written three years, about three years after 1 Peter. And it's believed that it was written from Rome in prison. So kind of what is going on right now, what kind of uh, outlook is going on, I'll read a little something from a devotional I read this week. Or not. Okay, so I won't. <laughs> That's okay. He didn't, want, he didn't want me to read it anyway. So, um, to give you a little outtake, so right now during this time, we believe that Peter is in prison when he's writing this, and he is writing to Christians about complacency, which is what we'll be covering today, and he's also writing about uh, false teachers which will be covered, uh, who's ever delivering the sermon in the future, next couple weeks. Um, right now, it's under Roman rule, uh, Emperor Nero, and he has a deep, seething kind of hate for Christians, so he's ordered the persecution of them. And that's what they are experiencing, which is what First Peter was telling them to be prepared for, strengthening them. So now he's speaking, uh, speaking to us while he's in the prison about our walk. There we are. Verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So... Unfortunately, we're in a time where if you don't really read everything in its complete context or witness it yourself, people tend to take snippets to get some kind of agenda across. So if you were to read this quickly and take in part, you say, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what he's not saying that, he's not judging or saying that, his faith is higher than yours, and, and there are certain levels. We have all obtained an equal shared faith, and it's because of God's righteousness. 
It's his saving righteousness. So it's an equal playing field. Now, the other thing that's really uh, neat about here is at the end, he, call, he says, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So right here, he is actually acknowledging Christ's divinity. He's calling him God and Christ. Uh, there's not too many times in the New Testament where those two go hand in hand together, just a few. So it's uh, very important to remember that, that he is acknowledging this. May grace and peace be multiplied by you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So highlighted knowledge, because I want you to pay attention to how many times he uses that word in the scripture. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So knowledge would be learning to know God better. I got to point it this way, right? Okay. That's why I'm touching it three times. What's that, Chris? That Was that me? Okay, it's on. I'm not that technologically savvy, but I did make this PowerPoint. Just don't tell my, just don't tell my work that I do it because I don't do it for them. Only do it for you guys. All right. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So knowledge of him to give him glory and excellent through his excellence. By which... He has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So his precious and very great promises he has granted us. We know one of those promises, and that's our salvation. We spend eternity in heaven with him. But, you see, promises is plural. There are other promises as well. That he has provided to us. So, I guess the question is how do we experience this gift? Well, lucky for us, this comes with instructions. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for God. For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, God, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So when he talks about the precious and very good promises, Ephesians 2.10 here. <clears throat> so God's doing two things simultaneously. Here one is he's developing or preparing our promise. Now, this is the easy one because it says we are created in his workmanship. So he is, that just involves him, and we know he's capable of anything and everything. So developing our promise is the easy part. It's the second part where it gets a little muddy because he also has to develop and prepare us for the promise. That involves us partaking in this task. That's why it gets muddy because, as said before, because of sinful desires, that's what keeps us in our relationship and growing with, with God. Second Peter 1, 5 through 7. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. So essentially what this is saying is make every effort to live a godly life. So let's dissect each one of these if we could. There it is, making every effort to live a godly life. Faith, Hebrews 11.1, 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, 
the conviction of things not seen. So the faith we're talking about here is a, is, is a, a faith of obedience. So lots of kids here. Parents, we give kids chores. We ask a kid to clean their room. They say they clean their room, you go in and all their dirty laundry shoved underneath their bed. <laughs> or we ask them, wash, your di- wash the dishes. So they go and they wash the dishes, you see them in the dry rack, but then you go and you look in the sink and all that gunk from all the places is still in the bottom of the sink. <laughs> Parents, how does that make you feel? A little irritating, right? Okay, well, that's how God feels when he... When we are trying to listen to God and he is giving us a task, he wants us to complete that task fully. He doesn't want us to do it whatever's convenient, whatever's comfortable. You know, if, oh, that's a little scary. I don't know if I want to go that far and do all that, God. Well, the reason he's given you instructions is complete them fully, not just partially. So essentially, we're irritating him. Virtues. What is a Virtue. We talk about virtues. We just talked about Veterans Day this past week. So one virtue, a traitor quality, um, would be honor. Honor is a virtue, right? Chivalry, chivalry of virtue. These are things that are from a transformed heart, not an outward change. It's a sacrifice, something you're doing for others without gaining anything in return. All of those there could essentially be virtues. And the next is knowledge, which we said is learning to know God better. We've seen that in here quite a bit. So how do we gain knowledge? How do we learn about God better? Well, when I met my wife back in February of 97... I instantly realized I wanted to get to know her better. So I went up to her and I gave her a piece of paper and I said, hi, my name's Jeremy. Here's a list of my likes and don't likes and things about me. I want you to study it for a week. I'll come in, I'll give you a test. And then if you pass, we'll get hitched. All right? Sound like a plan? That's not really what happened. Not at all. So listen, I wanted to get to know her better, not here, but here. So in order to do that, it required spending time with one another. And the more time we spent together, the more I wanted to get to know her, the closer I became to her, the more she trusted me and relayed more information about her to me. That's the kind of knowledge that God wants to have with us. He wants us to get to know him on a personal, relational level, not just a textual or theological, it's a big word, level. He wants to have a personal relationship with us. And the more that he realizes that we are all in, the more he will reveal to us. These are the promises that he's talking about. So he's prepared these promises for us, but it's up to us and our relationship growing with him and whether or not he is going to deliver these promises. Make sense? He has to trust that we are going to do the right thing with the promises that he's giving us. The next is self-control, which is the ability to say no when you are supposed to. Doing the right thing even when it's hard or not popular. What was happening back then, it doesn't seem to be much different today. The things that we do here, the things that we do for God are not popular right now. They are not the mainstream but we really aren't suffering for it. So why is it so tough? The ability to say no when you're supposed to. Anyone here ever go on a diet? (laughs) Not me, because that means I have to eat less food. I'm not about to eat less food for anybody right now, okay? So, but because my wife loves me, she has me making healthier choices. So I'm still consuming the same amount of food. I'm just eating better stuff. So. Steadfastness, being firm or unwavering. James 1.3, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So when you're in school and you're taking a class, 
teacher's giving you all kinds of information, just hoping you'll soak it all up and you're learning everything. But he wants to be sure that you are learning everything that he's teaching you, so he's going to give you a test. If you pass that test, you get to move on to the next grade. So if you're in first grade, now you go to second grade, second grade, you go to third grade. So as you continue to learn more about that subject, the harder it gets. The, the test might be a little more difficult. God does the same thing. You may feel like sometimes, where is God in all this? Some things that you're going through. It could be just that he's testing your faith. He wants to trust that he can give you more to do, give you more promises, different promises, because you are all in. You're not just doing what's comfortable or convenient. The next is godliness, reflecting the nature of the kingdom of God in the course of everyday life. So notice he says here kingdom. He doesn't say heaven. Right? So reflecting godliness here on earth, he'll actually help you bring a little heaven down here. Everyday life. Not Tuesdays and Sundays, not Wednesdays and Sundays. Every day, seven days a week. Next is brotherly affection. Romans 12.10 says, Love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So Brian's my brother. Don's my brother. It doesn't mean outdo one another. It doesn't mean rolling around on the floor at Denny's to see who's going to pick up the breakfast tab. All right? This is more than that. Honor. We talked about honor. It's a virtue. It's a trait. Sacrificing of yourself for others. And of course, last but not least, is love. Love is the ultimate result of an active faith. Obedient faith requires action. That's why they say walk in faith, step out in faith, a leap of faith, running the race, putting on the full armor of God. All these are actions. They require movement. Faith is measured by movement. Tony Evans always says that, if you listen to Tony. So you need to have an active faith. 2 Corinthians 5.7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. James 2.17 so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Remember Ephesians 2.10, it said he's created us in his workmanship, for workmanship, right? Works. We get up every day and go to work. Relationships require work. My wife and I have spent more than half our life together now. And it always has not been sunshines and rainbows. A lot of that because of me. Be willing to admit humility. <laughs> but it's worth fighting for. I never stop getting to know her. There's always something to learn. There's always more to reveal. There's always change. The biggest change in our marriage was when we decided to make Christ the center of it. That's not how our marriage started, so it was rough. Luckily, before we made that commitment, we did have a pact. We said we would never go to bed mad at one another. So that's a good start. So morally, we already had it in here. She loved me in here, I love her in here, and we wanted to do whatever it took. We wanted to work to make it work. That's what God wants from us. I mean, think about it. We're talking about Peter here. Peter was a fisherman by trade, right? He was out fishing all day. Cast his net on the other side. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So just before he gets ashore, Jesus says, hey, throw your net on the other side. He's been fishing all day. This is not the first time he's ever been fishing. He's a fisherman by trade. This is how he makes his living. I'm not going to catch fish on the other side. But just a little bit of faith, just a little faith, even if it was begrudgingly, all right, fine, I'll throw it on the other side for one time. And look, and he blessed him. 
because he took that leap of faith. He trusted Jesus. That's what he's asking of us, to trust him in everything we do. Romans 1.17, For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, it is as written, the righteous shall live by faith. Living, action, movement. Sorry, coming off my ear. Verse 8, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So see, it is action. If these qualities are yours, you are increasing so that you continue to learn, you continue to grow in your relationship with God. We can't get complacent. We can't get comfortable. But we have to hold each other accountable. That was mentioned today as members. I think that's very important to encourage one another, to hold each other accountable. I wouldn't be up here right now if it was on my own accord, but a loving brother was sitting back there, and I'm very encouraged that he's here today, came up to me and said, I think you need to be up here. I thought he was crazy. <laughs> so I'm stepping out of my comfort zone in doing this. But this is all God. This is not me at all. And I realized, you know, his encouraging words and his faith in me to be up here was encouraging to be up here. But little did I know, like a couple weeks later, I realized that he subtly was kind of calling me a wuss. <laughs> All right? But, hey, stop being a wuss for Jesus. Verse 9, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So listen, when you've accepted Jesus as your personal savior, savior, you're granted eternity in heaven with him. But he created us to work for him. It says we're going to grow. We are to grow. We are to continue. We are to advance. As we mentioned, faith is measured in movement. That book we got, The Four Voices, anybody read it? Okay, great. You should read it. Listen, if I can read it, it's less than 200 pages. I'll be honest, it took me five months to get through it. But me getting through any book front to back is a, is a victory. I'm not even lying. I'm not much of a sitter and a, and a reader. So if I can do it, you can do it. And there's a lot of great stuff in that book. Very encouraging. So I encourage you, I challenge you to read that book. In that book, R.C. Sproul has this. Wrong. Faith plus works equals salvation. Wrong. Faith equals salvation. Right. Faith equals salvation plus works. I thought that to be very uh, to the point. Galatians 5.16 or not? Did I go too fast? Aha, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. Verse 10. Yeah, thank you. 
Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. When will you fall? Never. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. If you want to be good at something, you have to practice it. Even if you practice and practice and practice, you will never be perfect at it. You could be very good. But this, it's telling you will never fall. Not never fail, because there will be failures along the way. These are your tests that we talked about. But you got to brush yourself off and continue, continue moving forward. Sometimes we skip practice. Sometimes I skip practice. Sometimes we've got something better to do. Sometimes there's another show to watch. Sometimes there's another friend to hang out with. Sometimes there's an extra hour that has to be done at work. We can't lose sight of what is important. We're not saying that that other stuff is not important, but our relationship with God is the most important. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The eternal kingdom. In this way there will be richly provided. So we already, because of our salvation, we already have our ticket punched to the eternal kingdom. But if you step out in faith and you are, and God reveals these promises to you, and you follow him fully, there will be treasures upon just going. You'll be richly provided. So the entrance is there, we're already there, but be richly provided means we have to be faithful and we have to have action today. We have to grow in our faith, we have to encourage others, lead others to Christ. That is our goal. Verses 12 through 14. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. So Peter is saying he intends always to remind you of these qualities though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. He, he says, I think it right as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. So through God's glory and excellence, he has continued to remind them of these things. He is encouraging them. He is lifting them up. He is holding them accountable. This is what he's talking about. So they don't become complacent. That we were created, that we all have gifts and talents that are here to use to, to, to glorify God. He mentions soon, I'll be putting the putting off of my body as Lord Jesus Christ made clear to him. So if we go back after he cast that net on the other side and was blessed with all those fish, and he came to shore and Jesus said, follow me. He also told him this, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. So he told Peter, Follow me. But by following me, you are going to lose your life. That did not deter Peter at all. He stepped out in faith. He continued on that path with Jesus. We know he walked with him for three years, learned from him. We also know shortly after this, he was crucified. Peter, after he wrote this, but he was crucified upside down. He asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel that he was worthy to be crucified the same way that Christ was. 
So he was told that he was going to lose his life, and he still chose to follow Christ. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. So he's all in. Every effort, he's 100% in. Why? Because he knows that what he's doing is to give God the glory and the excellence. And he has faith. And his faith has revealed to him what his abilities and his talents are, and he's using them. So he's all in 100% using those abilities and talents until my departure and even after my departure. So that is extraordinary faith. Even after I'm gone, I'm doing this now. So even after I'm gone, it will still be there for you. So you can recall these things. And I'm going to say mission accomplished. But that's because of God. He did his calling and election for God's glory and excellence. Now, was Peter special? Yes, of course he was. Are you special? Of course you are. From a worldly standpoint, though, was Peter special? He's a fisherman. He wasn't like Jacques Cousteau. Nothing would had no notoriety. Young kids, no, you guys don't know who Jacques Cousteau is, do you? <laughs> All right, so he wasn't in Galilee's deadliest catch. He wasn't like a reality TV star or something. So he was a fisherman. Matthew was a, worked for the Roman IRS. James and John were fishermen. You have shepherds. You have small business owners. You have a doctor. See, it doesn't matter who you are now or what you are doing. We are all special to God. We all have talents and abilities that he wants us to use to glorify him and bring others to Christ. He wants this team to be so huge. He wants everybody on that team. I mean, is anybody a baseball fan here? Baseball. So the Atlanta Braves won the World Series. They were not expected to win the World Series. All the way through, sports writers, oh, they're going to lose this round. Then the next round, oh, they're going to lose this round. Then they win a game, oh, they're going to lose this round. Everybody was just down on them. Then when they started getting to the big game, they started getting all kinds of uh, publicity. But it wasn't for their playing. It was because of their nickname. And I'm not here to determine whether their name right, wrong, or indifferent. That's not what it's about. But there's a lot of noise surrounding them. There's a lot of questions even to the players. How, do you, how can you play for a team that's got that nickname? Why are you doing this? It had nothing to do with the focus the prize at hand, but they kept their head in it. They kept focused on what their task at hand was. They didn't get all annoyed or turned around with all that noise going on the outside, all the doubters that said they couldn't do it, they had, didn't have the abilities. They stuck together. They held each other up. They all did their job, and they were victorious in the end. And they did it with a chance to be victorious, a chance. We know we have victory. That's, right. Amen. That's just an awesome thing. They couldn't have gone out there with nine first basemen and done that, right? Because everybody has a job. Everybody has to put in work. Everybody's talents and abilities are different. That's what makes us a church family. We all work with one another to deliver, to get to the final victory. Will we, have some, will we lose some games along the way? Of course we will. But we get back up on our feet and we encourage each other and we keep going. To glorify God, have His excellence revealed through us. They said, we just heard it here today, when you let your light shine, people want to know what it is different about you. In today's day and age, people are searching for truth more than they ever have because the truth is not readily available anymore. It's just not. Everywhere you turn, it's nothing but lies and deceit and conformity and, you know, watered-down religion. God is unchanging. The ultimate, it's Jesus Christ is still the way, the only way. 
And his word is truth. All truth. So I'm going to end this with a challenge. Not to yourself, because this has also been for me. This has been very convicting for the last four, four weeks I've been working on this sermon. It's really spoke to me about my efforts, my actions, my priorities. So I put that out to you all as I feel for myself. Are we using all of our talents and abilities to glorify God? Are we using our talents and abilities to bring others to Christ? You know, when you watch these games on TV, you can't help sometimes to wish or dream that you're out there on the field with those guys, right? I mean, that's just how we are. Well, you can be on the playing field. You don't have to wish or dream for it. So, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then it's time to go to work. And if you haven't, we'd love to have you on the team. 100%. There's not one person sitting here that knows Jesus would not want you on their team. So if you don't know him and you want to know him, please come talk with one of us after the sermon and we'd be happy to pray with you. I'm going to close right here. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful and thankful for your word and your word that challenges us to live a life for you, to live Christ-like, to live in godliness. We're so thankful for the word that teaches us how to do these things, how it encourages us to do these things. Just ask that as a church family, we continue to encourage one another, hold each other accountable, Lift each other up. Carry one another when we need it. But in order to do that, we have to open up to one another. We have to know each other's struggles. Not any one person's struggle is greater than another's. We know we can all be victorious through you. If there's anyone here that does not know You, Jesus, today, we just ask that they, in their hearts, come forward and seek your face, Lord, knowing that you died on the cross for them, shed your blood for their sins. We pray as we go out this week, you encourage us to be a light to the world around us, a world that is filled with darkness, to speak truth. There are so many that are seeking it. Give them comfort that finding you, they will find truth. We pray these things in your name. Amen.